It's a place where spectacles are built, upside down, where cheap t-shirts and titanic attractions occupy the same real estate. Five Star Dining competes with all you can eat for your appetite and your dollars. Luxury accommodations await you, yet a modest bed can still be found. And thousands of travelers network, discover new products, and showcase new technologies inside one of the largest centers in the world. Welcome to International Drive, the epicenter of all that's bold and exciting in the middle of a little vacation spot. Perhaps you've heard of it, Orlando, Florida. International Drive, or iDrive for short, is tailor-made for the thrill-seekers and thrill-makers alike. Yet it might have been like any ordinary street in Orlando, if not for a very large neighbor to the south. And the visionaries and businessmen who gambled on Orlando, believing it would someday become the tourist capital of the world. In fact, less than 50 years ago, while many North American cities were reaching for the skies and sprawling to the seas, Orlando was barely on the map. There was only green in the beginning. The interstate highways and the Florida Turnpike, they did not exist. A lot of entrepreneurial people came and they saw and they put their money on the line and did. We were people who, who just um, had faith in in what we were doing and, and believe that uh, with Disney and SeaWorld and Universal and, and a myriad of other smaller attractions and wonderful weather and, and friendly people that this was going to become a prime destination. All of a sudden we found ourselves at the crossroads of the interstate highway system. Everything is just blowing up. The convention center up and online and growing. We've become a major player in the, a major world destination. Whew. Well, boy, we, we did all that in uh, really in 30, 40 years. So that, that, that's amazing. Inside the story of International Drive is a narrative about the growth of a city and the creation of an identity. A story about entrepreneurs who, with a lot of available land, money, timing, and luck, paved a strip of land and helped produce a destination. Orlando was not a destination for tourists. A lot of folks might stay overnight here on their way to, the, to South Florida or on the way to the beaches, but Orlando was not a tourist destination place. It was significantly in agricultural endeavors, uh, truck farming, cattle farming, citrus. Because of its central location in the peninsula of Florida and because of the coming construction and plans for uh, I-4 and the Florida Turnpike and other road improvements, it was being viewed as a good place for distribution. That would change when a company deeply rooted in air and space technology picked Orlando as its new site. In 1956, the Martin Company, later Martin Marietta, now Lockheed Martin, bought 7,300 acres of land for $1.95 million. That land stretched from what it is today, I-4 on the west, South Orange Blossom Trail on the east, Oak Ridge Road to the north, and the B-Line, now called the Beach Line, to the south. That big box of property was owned by the Martin Company. The Martin Missile Plant opened in 1957 and launched a decade of economic opportunities for Central Florida. A little further south, another company with big dreams also set its sights on over 20,000 acres of Central Florida swampland. I had come to this area in 1967 as city manager of Winter Park, and as such, I had no particular interest in what would someday be International Drive. But there were some meetings going out here for Disney that was in the state of becoming. And I came out a couple of times to a meeting. 
and you had this sense that things were going to change. Things did change, and quickly. Walt Disney World opened in 1971. Soon thousands of tourists would descend upon Orlando. Local developers sought to capitalize on Disney dollars. For one, Orlando would need more hotels. Along came businessman Finley Hamilton. Finley was an attorney and a home builder uh, in the Orlando area when it was just a sleepy little citrus town. He owned a hotel, the Hilton Inn, on West Colonial Drive over in what is Pine Hills today. He decided that after Walt Disney announced he was going to build Walt Disney World in 1965, that he was going to put up a hotel somewhere out, out that way. So Sand Lake Road was about the last road you hit before you got to Disney. It was a, a lot of it was vacant and he decided to build this hotel in the middle of nowhere, which all of his friends criticized him about. They call it Finley's Folly. In a 2005 interview, Finley Hamilton said he made a lucky guess when in 1968 he paid $90,000 for 10 acres of land to build his hotel. Nothing around it except palmettos and uh, grass. It was a, a difficult to sell uh, to a partner. But that didn't discourage him. Finley Hamilton opened the Hilton Inn South in 1970, a year before Disney opened, a lone hotel in the middle of nowhere. When families would drive down I-4, they'd get off at Sand Lake Road, they would go up the dirt road to the Hilton Inn. Eventually, he would have to pave a new road for the families staying at his hotel. I first tried to name it uh, Hamilton Drive, and, uh, which I thought was a very nice name. And it turned out uh, Hamilton Drive was already being used in Orange County, out in East Orange County. So he decided to name it International Drive because it sounded big and important. Finley would later buy up more land to the north of uh, his hotel. And he would be a major player in the development of the northern stretch of International Drive. North I Drive was kind of Wild West. Here's a parcel of land, you want to buy it, put on it whatever you want, goodbye. There were a handful of four or five hotels, no attractions whatsoever. International Drive, of course, didn't happen all at one time. And you really have to start with what's called North International Drive, which had really begun as an office research park warehousing district. And it slowly progressed down to Sand Lake Road, and it stopped. And so you had a low-rise kind of a development of, uh, of hotels and motels, many of them individual entrepreneurship coming in and building there, and everyone admitting that they were feeding off of Disney, which, by the way, at that time had decided they would not really build much in the way of hotels and motels on their property. So you saw North Eye Drive and then subsequently other parts of iDrive developed as a result of the fact that there, there were people to be serviced. While Disney and North iDrive were in their infant stages, another theme park visionary and his partners targeted Orlando's expanding tourist market. In the 1960s, SeaWorld had already launched two successful parks in California and Ohio. Founder George Malay felt if Orlando was good enough for a mouse, why not a whale? To help secure a location, Malay enlisted the help of a young Orlando attorney, Kelly Smith. George Malay was a West Coast guy, a real doer, determined, not worried about economics, we'll just do it. Really interesting fellow. He developed SeaWorld in San Diego. He was good friends with some Disney executives. Said he wanted to come to Florida after Disney had come to Florida. And he uh, talked to them about it. And uh, they said, come on, we need more things there to bring people in. So George arrives on the scene with his sidekick, good fella, Ron Harper. And we go about looking for land. Not too expensive land. That green looked pretty good as far as expense. They liked the site that they have now. But he said, you can't see it from my floor, maybe. So we went out there and we filled 
a helium balloon and put it up in the air about 200 feet to assure him that, that you would be able to see this for my four. And the long and the short, negotiated contract with what was in Florida Land Company. Originally bought about 125 acres with some options on some more, and they were off and running. SeaWorld opened in 1973. While park guests may have stayed in low-budget hotels along North Eye Drive, there was only one way in and one way out. The street Finley Hamilton called International Drive still dead-ended at Sand Lake Road. The vacant land of palm meadows and swamps beyond Sand Lake belonged to Martin Marietta. SeaWorld was in kind of a cul-de-sac. You could come down, you could come back, you couldn't go anywhere from SeaWorld. And so you had one little piece of I drive down near SeaWorld that dead ended again. And it wasn't until Jim Brown and Orlando Central Park developed the two miles of Plaza International that it extended on down to uh, the uh, uh, B line, now called the Beach Line. In 1963, Martin Marietta realized they had more land than the missile company needed. The defense group launched Orlando Central Park, a real estate company primarily responsible for non-tourist business development. The general manager of OCP was a 29-year-old engineer recruited from Texas who would soon find himself in the midst of Orlando's growing vacation industry. I arrived with a wife and I and two children. I arrived on March the 15th, 1963. We've loved it ever since. To start our development back in 63, Lockheed Martin transferred something over 2,000 acres for us to plan and develop. And then later in the, in the 70s, they transferred acreage along I Drive and uh, down the front of the north side of the B-Line. The commitment that our new corporate owner put on us was pretty simple. You, you go there and you be good citizens and uh, you help build that community and change these swamps in, into dollars for us. Jim Brown and his team would eventually get their chance to turn those swamps into dollars. But a financial recession brought on by conflicts with the Middle East nearly crippled Orlando's young tourist economy. Everybody thought when Disney opened, everybody's gonna be 100%, it was no problem. Well, it didn't happen that way. And to make it even worse, that oil embargo hit soon after Disney opened, and it was a bloodbath. Uh, hardly any hotel really survived that. They were either sold to somebody else at a cheap price, or uh, in some cases foreclosed. So it was tough, tough after Disney opened for a number of years for it, before it really got rolling and got better. The oil embargo of the 1970s meant very little fuel was available to gas up the car and take the family to Florida. But that didn't stop entrepreneurs from planting their dreams on iDrive. An ambitious young man from Hell's Kitchen with experience in the hotel industry came to work for Disney World and then was fired. I thought my life at Disney was pretty secure. But my boss's boss called me in for um, a meeting and um, I thought it was to congratulate me and tell me what a wonderful job I'd done and to give me what I thought was a long overdue raise. Uh, but instead he said that it, although I had done a great job, it, it had become abundantly clear to the Disney hierarchy that I would never become a Disney person. I promised myself that I would never, ever, ever work for anybody else again. And so I, uh, even if it meant selling hot dogs at Church Street. And so I, I decided to go into business for myself and put together a plan and started looking for a hotel and found a little quality in through Kelly. Harris got in his first hotel in uh, 74 and that was at Quality 7600. The owner had not been in the hotel business. It was those bad times, and the manager of that hotel called me. He said, I gotta find a buyer for this hotel. I just, my owner wants to get out. We met uh, another uh, individual who was interested in investing in the hotel, and the three of us uh, acquired uh, the Quality Inn uh, shortly thereafter. 
I don't think we paid more than $20,000 for it. Starting a business in the middle of a national crisis meant that Harris Rosen had to cut some corners. The, the $20,000 I had, I gave up for the hotel, and so I, I really had nothing left. I, I lived in the hotel, and, and I did probably six or seven different jobs there in order to save payroll. Um, and that's when I decided to purchase a very large German Shepherd who would essentially become my security officer. He lived there for many years with his dog, Rin Tin Tin, and uh, he worked as a security guard there, as a manager. Uh, he would help do landscaping, he would help cut meat in the restaurant. I did all the night runs and I was the general manager and I was the director of sales, the food and beverage manager. I did all the carving at night. And we saved probably around two or three hundred thousand dollars that way and, and actually became profitable uh, in a very short period of time. Harris Rosen took his extreme dedication a step further. With only his business cards and a will to succeed, Rosen took his marketing campaign on the road. I didn't have any money to spend, and so I hitchhiked from here to um, Salem, Massachusetts, and started looking for uh, bus companies that might have an interest in staying at a new little quality inn. I didn't have any contracts with me. I had little business cards, and we would ask the presidents of the bus companies what rate they would be willing to pay at our hotel. And um, they would tell me and I would write it down on one of my cards and I would sign my name. And I would ask them if they would sign their name and that was essentially a handshake contract. And the rates back then, and this is 1974, uh, June, July, were probably anywhere from $7.50 a night to $8.50 a night. So I hitchhiked back to Orlando with about a dozen cards and business started coming in, buses started coming, even though there was an oil embargo going on. About two or three weeks after I came back, the embargo was lifted and then people started coming to Orlando and, and things started to change dramatically. International Drive rebounded from the recession and more hotels and attractions would soon be ready for business. The wave of economic opportunity was perfect for the man with aquatic ambitions. George Millay was ready to make another splash on iDrive. George parted ways with SeaWorld, they had a falling out, and uh, about 1976, he uh, came to me and said, I'm looking for land down on iDrive, I've got this idea for water park. Well, he'd seen in Toronto and some other places small water parks, but nobody really put all the elements together like he did. He had been at the Canadian National Exposition and had seen a water ride, and he had been to different places around the country, swimming holes and places that had slides. So he was going to take the best of a number of things and add to it, and that's, that's what became Wet n' Wild, which became the anchor of North Eye Drive. I went out with him on that site, he was going to show me the great site he'd found. And he went out there waving his arms and talking about, this will go here, that'll be the pool over there, and we're up to our ankles, literally, in mushy red clay. And I'm thinking, George, you think big. <laughs> but, he, you know, again, he was a doer, he, he was determined he was going to do that thing, and he did it. He helped bring tourists to iDrive, um, who would stay in the hotels of Harris Rosen and others and buy t-shirts and whatnot from people on iDrive. So he really helped bring some tourists there as a destination and not just as a transit point for people heading to Disney World. While North International Drive rebounded from the recession, Orlando Central Park was growing as more corporations located to Central Florida. By the late 1970s, Jim Brown, now president of OCP, began developing plans for the two-and-a-half-mile stretch of land beyond Sand Lake Road. One of the most significant things that ever happened was Jim Brown, Martin Marietta, Orlando Central Park, decided to kickstart the southern part of the drive there. It was an interesting time of growth and challenge and understanding for people like me who had been successful already in the uh, warehouse and office and, and mixed utilization, that type of development. 
all of a sudden we're not thinking at all about just warehousing and that sort of thing. We're thinking about what does the tourist and the convention uh, attendees, what do they need, what do they do? And we begin to study and learn and we developed a master plan for this area that is the host community for the Orange County Convention Center. The idea of building a convention center had been in the community for some time. There was a small effort at one time to try to convince hotel motel owners to voluntarily uh, commit to a certain portion based on how close they would be to a convention center as to how some of their profits going to support it. Uh, those type of cooperative efforts never really work, unfortunately. Jim Harris then told me, don't go away. He said, we're not going to quit this project. We're going to have to have a, this facility. Orlando Central Park agreed to donate 75 acres of land to Orange County for the convention center. Jim Brown envisioned South Eye Drive as an upscale tourist district named Plaza International. We call it tourist commercial because nobody else had a term for it, so we made up our own. We begin to understand all the aspects of the, the visitor, that, that be a family vacation visitor or a convention visitor or a trade show visitor. They have all kind of needs that, that this community didn't have. However, the county still needed to pay for the facility and that meant convincing the public that a new tax could pick up the tab. It wasn't until uh, a gentleman in the state legislature named Hyatt Brown, who by the way deserves a great deal of credit for all of this, got through the legislature a, a uh, re what's called a resort tax, the tourist development tax. Here you had to have a referendum to enact it for 2% of the hotel motel uh, bill. And people don't like taxes. Even if they're not going to pay it, they don't like taxes. And so there was a contested election to try to establish that resort tax in Orange County. Not all of us believe that conventions would um, one day become a significant part of uh, our market. I did. We thought that conventions would be a natural for Orlando and fought very hard to have a referendum passed. Part of the way of convincing people to do it was to say, we don't have an arena, we don't have a good auditorium, we don't have a good place to hold any community events, but we can build not just a convention center, we can build a multi-purpose facility in which you can come and listen to music and see a Broadway play. It may not be an auditorium, but it will be a large open space. And we had pledged to the people that all of this would be done solely out of the resort tax. We would never pledge property taxes or other revenues of the county toward this. Enough people accepted that idea that they passed the tax, but it was something like a 60-40 vote. It was not a huge vote in favor of even doing any of this. There was one more wrinkle in the battle to build a convention center. Orlando Central Park's location faced unexpected competition. We had already gone through this offer one time and, and ours was judged to be the preferred site. But in the meantime, the, everybody in the community had learned a little. We were all kind of growing, looking forward. And when it came up again, there were three or four other sites that were offered. The county uh, asked people to submit sites. One was on Kirkman Road where Universal Studios is presently located. One was just south of SeaWorld where Dolphin Cove is now located. One was downtown in the old fairgrounds where the present arena and the Bob Carr Auditorium are located. The leadership and I think the Orlando Sentinel outside of my particular knowledge at that time, decided that they were going to have a, a straw vote on the ballot for preference. So everybody who wanted us to go there was doing a little campaign. It was a little political campaign. 
that the folks in the city limits very much wanted the funds to go to them to build a convention center down there at Lake Eola. We thought that was a stupid idea. And so we fought um, gallantly against that idea. They were not good losers. We wiped them out with the vote, but getting there, I was, when they first did that, I was so angry, I just wanted to have a fit. I wanted to hurt somebody. But one of my wise friends in Orlando said, "Ah, oh, be quiet. This is a no-brainer. If we don't put this thing on the ballot and create some excitement in the newspaper and in the community, we're not going to pass the referendum. We're not going to have a res resort tax. Hmm. I said, well, I think I can understand that. I spent $35,000 running a campaign to make my site be the choice. I don't know what all those other guys spent. Jim Brown at Orlando Central Park and the Martin Marietta Company did an excellent job. They put on a TV program that showed people with a map and saying, here is the B-Line and here's I-4 and here's Sand Lake Road, here's Disney and here's our site. And that site got the most votes. The resort tax passed in 1978 and Orlando Central Park's site was the people's choice for the new convention center. Orange County, Jim Harris and Jim Brown began a relationship that would define International Drive and Central Florida for years to come. Those two were very instrumental. They really worked together to come up with a plan development to really make it lush and walkable, very wide sidewalks and things like that, and give uh, the Convention Center District the look it has today, and it was very, very successful. Jim Harris is one of the finest men that I know in the world. He and I developed a mutually respectful uh, relationship because we had to work through some hard stuff. It wasn't easy. Orange County was a rural county type government. But working with Jim Harris was a pro. He was a professional. You begin with, with nothing. Uh, Plaza International did not even have a road, let alone sewer and water and electricity, or a single hotel motel room within two miles. We kind of started from nowhere. But Jim Harris had valuable input into the transition of Orange County from yesterday to today. As I used to kid uh, Jim, all, your, all, all this 500 acres is doing, Jim, is just holding the earth together. That's about its contribution at this point, but it had potential. On the next International Drive, The Road to Success, the Convention Center is up and running. The Convention Center is an extraordinary place to work. Sometimes we're seeing something unfold that hasn't been exposed yet to the world. Hotels are on the rise. 6,500 rooms and 4,500 employees. We've been blessed beyond anything we've ever imagined. Attractions grow bigger and bolder. You don't build something like this where people go, holy cow. You're out of business before you start. Visitors shop, dine, and party. And Orlando's famous strip really becomes international. <laughs>